Let's turn now to Hebrews chapter 10. Now we have made mention how that there seems to be a bridge between each chapter as uh, he sort of carries the thought from the previous chapter through to the next chapter. In the ninth chapter, uh, he is talking about um, the heavenly sanctuary. In verse 23, it was therefore necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. Uh, so the tabernacle was only the pattern, the model of heaven. And it should be purified with the various sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy place that is made with hands. Uh, he didn't enter into the temple here in the holy place of the temple uh, because that is only a figure of the true, only a model of the true. But Jesus entered into heaven itself, of which this is a model, to appear in the presence of God for us. Our great high priest didn't enter into the holy of holies uh, with, uh, you know, behind the veil, but he entered into heaven itself and uh, to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of the various sacrifices. For then he must have often suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Annually, the high priest would offer the sin, the offerings for the sin of the nation year by year on Yom Kippur. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. God laid on him the iniquities of us all. And unto them that look for him, soon and very soon, he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And so it goes right in for the law, having a shadow of good things to come. It is only a foreshadowing. It was a type of, and it foreshadowed the good things to come. Uh, Paul talking about the holy days, the sacrifices for the new moons, the Sabbath days and all, he said, that these things were a shadow of the things to come. The substance is Jesus. These were all foreshadowing Jesus and his sacrifice for us. So these were only a shadow of the things to come. They were not the very image of the things. Uh, they were just foreshadowing. They were speaking of that which was to come. And they can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. The law could only provide a covering for your sin. It could not put away your sin. It could only give you a foreshadowing of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world. You remember when John announced him, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Not covers the sins, but takes away the sins of the world. The sacrifices of the Old Testament under the law could not take away sin. They could not make you perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? If the one sacrifice had been sufficient, then why would they have to do it year after year after year after year? If they could be perfect, if they were complete, would they not have then just ceased to be offered? They would have done it once, and that would have been sufficient. Because that the worshipers, once purged, should have no more conscience of sins. Once your sins have actually been put away, you shouldn't have a consciousness 
of your sins any longer. But those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. Actually, they give you a constant reminder of your sin. They didn't put away your sin, but only reminded you of how sinful you really are, for it is impossible that the blood of bulls or of goats could take away sins. The Hebrew word is kofar. He shall make an atonement uh, in our English Bible, but in the Hebrew, it, he shall make a kofar, and the word literally is a covering. Under the Old Testament sacrifices, their sins were covered. They were not put away. Impossible that the blood of bulls or goats could put away sin. Thereby, those who died under the law, the Old Testament saints, died in faith, as we will uh, the crossover into the next chapter. He's going to talk about all of these men of faith. They died in faith, but they didn't receive the promise because it was impossible that their sins could be put away in the sacrifices of bulls and goats. The blood of bulls and goats could not put away sin. They could only cover the sin. But Jesus in his sacrifice has put away our sins. Therefore, it is not necessary for him every year to be crucified. It is not yet necessary for his sacrifice to be made over and over again. His sacrifice is complete. It is perfect. It is sufficient. And once he gave himself and for all, never again will it be necessary for the Son of God to give himself for sins. That is an accomplished fact once and for all. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you have had no pleasure. And then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Now, this is a quotation of Psalm 40, verses 6, 7, and 8. Let me read it out of Psalm, and you read it out of Hebrews, and you'll notice a slight difference. In Psalm 40, 6, 7, and 8, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offerings and sin offerings hast thou not required. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me, I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Now you say, how come when he's quoting from the psalm, it's different from the psalm itself? Most of the New Testament quotations from the Old Testament are taken from the Septuagint. 240 years before Jesus was born, when the Jews returned from their captivity, very few of them spoke Hebrew. Greek was the language of the world at that time because of Alexander the Great spreading the Greek culture throughout the world. And so uh, the Greek was the common language in the times of Jesus. And when they had returned from the Babylonian captivity, uh, they actually were speaking, of course, uh, the uh, Babylonian language. Later, Greek became the universal language. And because the Jews could not read Hebrew, they could not read their own law. They could not read their prophets. They couldn't read the Old Testament. And so they felt that they needed to give the people, the scriptures, in a language that they could read. So 
there were 70 scholars that set upon the task of translating the Hebrew into Greek. Septuagint is uh, the 70, referring to the 70 scholars, and they translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek so that the people could read the scriptures for themselves because they could read Greek, but they didn't know Hebrew. So possibly uh, outside of Jesus and Paul, probably none of the other apostles even knew the Hebrew language. But because the people were acquainted with the Septuagint and knew the Greek Septuagint, most of the quotations in the New Testament come from the Greek Septuagint rather than the original Hebrew Scriptures. Now, there is really no basic change in the meaning. Words sometimes are different. Uh, Mine ear hast thou opened is the Septuagint. Uh, a body thou hast prepared me is the Hebrew in the Psalms. But they basically mean the same thing. Uh, as you uh, take a look at the original Hebrew and uh, the Septuagint, basically they mean the same thing. My ear hast thou opened is a reference to uh, the uh, committing of yourself to the will of God as a bond slave. Uh, you remember if a person had served out his uh, allotted time as a slave and he said, well, I, I like it here. I uh, really am quite satisfied. I have no place to go. And I, the food is good. The uh, wages are good. I mean I, I mean, I have a nice place to live and I have born a children here and all. I like to just stay here. The master would bring you to the doorpost of the house. He would take an awl and he would pin your earlobe to the doorpost with the awl. He would drive the awl through the lobe of your ear up against the doorpost. And then they would put the ring in your ear. And that ring was the sign that you were a slave by choice. Uh, you were submitting to the will by choice. And so Jesus in the ear being pierced concept is that he willingly submitted himself to the will of the Father, especially in going to the cross and dying for our sins. So um, when he came into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body Thou hast prepared me, or you have pierced my ear in the Hebrew. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you've had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book, as it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Now above, when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings, and an offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. It is interesting that in the Old Testament, God did speak of the fact that he really was not pleased with their sacrifices. He said, when you lift up your hands in prayer, I will not hear you because your hands are filled with blood. Isaiah, or 1 Samuel rather, 15.22 when Saul had been commanded of God to utterly wipe out the Amalekites, animals and everything else, when he brought back some of the finest sheep and cattle and brought back some of the people, Samuel came out to meet him. And Saul greeted Samuel. He said, as the Lord liveth, I've done everything the Lord commanded me to do. And Samuel said, if you've done everything the Lord has commanded you to do, how come I hear the bleating of the sheep and the lowing of the cattle? And he said, oh, well, they were so nice, I thought I'd bring them back and offer them as sacrifice to God. They were so wonderful. They make great sacrifices. And Samuel answered, to obey is better 
than to sacrifice. And to hearken is better than the fat of rams. And he said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying his voice? Behold, it to obey is better than to sacrifice, and to listen it to God is better than the fat of rams. What the people had come to do is just the sacrifices became a ritual. They were no longer truly meaningful. They would go on and do their own thing, but then they would sacrifice to the Lord. But it didn't go beyond that. There are many people today that do their religious thing. Uh, they go to church on Christmas and Easter, or they go to church on Sunday morning, and that's their religious thing, and once they've done that, that's it. But it's, it's a rote, it's a, uh, it's a pattern, it's a habit, it isn't really a meaningful gathering to come into contact with God. And, and thus, uh, with the Old Testament, they were offering the sacrifices, but it, it wasn't a thing of the heart. And, and they weren't really living in obedience to God. They were doing their own thing, but faithful in sacrifice. But the Lord said, look, it's better to obey than to sacrifice. God would rather have you obedient to him than offering sacrifices. And to listen to God is better than offering the fat of rams. In Psalm 51, 6, after David had sinned, after he had gone into Bathsheba and, and that whole nasty episode, when faced with his guilt, he confessed. And then he pray, prayed this penitent prayer of Psalm 51. And in the prayer, verse 16, he said, You desire not sacrifice, else would I give it. You don't delight in the burnt offering. David recognized that his sin was so grievous, and, and it was a sin that he had committed knowing that he was doing wrong. And so he, he just said, you know, what you want is a penitent heart a, a, uh, that you won't despise. Now God actually spoke of despising their sacrifices. It came to that place where they were totally meaningless. God said in Isaiah, to what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and of the fat of fed beast. And I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who's required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, the calling of the assemblies, I can away with, it is iniquity, even your solemn meetings. Their heart wasn't in it. God wants our hearts. He doesn't want just outward perfunctory kind of, of service from us. He wants our hearts. He longs to fellowship with us. He wants a deeper relationship than just uh, lip service or, or just uh, perfunctory types of, well, I was there. Were you really there? Where was your heart when you were sitting there, you see? And they were offering the sacrifices, but God said, no, your heart's not in it. I'm sick of it. I'm tired of it. Don't bring me any more of your sacrifices. Your new moons, appointed days, feasts, my soul hates. They are trouble to me. I'm weary of them. And when you spread forth your hands, I'll hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I'll not hear you. Your hands are full of blood. Through Hosea the prophet, God said, For I desired mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than the burnt offerings. Put into practice. I'd rather that you show mercy unto others, that you would be loving and kind and forgiving to others. 
than to do some great service for me if your heart's not in it. In Amos, he said, I hate, I despise your feast days, and I'll not smell of your solemn assemblies. God said, I hate it, I detest it, I loathe it. When religion becomes a thing of rote, a meaningless ceremony, God hates it. He desires, really, our hearts. He said, though you offer me burnt offerings and your meal offerings, I will not accept them, and neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beast. I've had it. I won't accept any more. So, here in Hebrews, wherefore, when he came into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body you've prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you've had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book if it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Quite a statement. The statement is that the volume of the book is written of Jesus. The Old Testament is written concerning Jesus. He is there in types, in shadows, foreshadowing Jesus. He's there in the various types, the, those that were types of Christ, uh, types of his life, types of his ministry, as well as the direct prophecies concerning Jesus. The whole Old Testament is pointing toward Jesus. All of the sacrifices we're pointing toward Jesus. I've come in the volume of the book it is written of me. The whole book is really written of Jesus. They say that history is really his story. H-I-S-S-T-O-R-Y. Put an extra S in there and you've got it. History is his story. And it is interesting that he divides history and we divide time by him. The years before he came and the years since he has come. The before Christ and in the year of our Lord, the B.C. and the Anno Dom, uh, Domini. So uh, the vision of history. The volume of the book is written to me, to do thy will, obedience, you see, to obey is better than to sacrifice. And he came to do the will of the Father. Now when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you would not, neither did you have pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. And he took away the first, that is the first covenant, that approached to God by the offerings and the sacrifices which God said he was sick of. And he established the second, that is, access to God for all through him. He became the mediator between God and man. He became our great high priest. He didn't enter into the holy of holies of the temple, but he entered into heaven itself, of which the temple was just a mere foreshadowing of the real, the true, which is heaven itself. And Jesus entered into heaven for us. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus once for all. As I said, not an annual thing like the high priest and Yom Kippur. It's not an annual thing, but Jesus once for all, sacrificed himself for us. So how much better is this new and living way in Jesus? It isn't an annual event where we are annually reminded uh, of our guilt, but it is a once and for all. And so we look back at the finished work of Jesus and we realize that he was the perfect sacrifice, complete sacrifice. Nothing more is 
needed and nothing more can be added to it. And every priest that stands daily ministering and offering, oftentimes the same sacrifices, which never can take away sin. Now again, the repetition, they can't take away sin. The blood of bulls and goats can't not take away sin. They covered. Jesus took away our sins. We need to realize that. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Jesus said, The Father did not send me into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. He that believeth in me is not condemned. Your sins have been taken away. As Paul quotes David there in Romans 2, he said, as David saith, Oh, how happy is the man whose transgressions have been forgiven, whose sins have been covered. Oh, how happy is the man to whom God does not impute iniquity. You who are in Jesus Christ, you who have put your trust and faith in him and are walking in faith in him, Though we may stumble, though we may falter, God doesn't even make a record of it. Our sins have been covered. Our sins have been forgiven. They've been put away. Jesus took away our sin in his death upon the cross, something that the Old Testament sacrifices could never do, weren't designed to do, all they were designed was to point ahead to Jesus who would be the perfect sacrifice for man's sin. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. It's done. The redemption is a finished work. On the cross he cried, it is finished. The work of redemption. It's a finished work. There's nothing that you can do to add to what God has already done as far as your redemption is concerned. It is a finished work. You are complete in Him. And from now on, He's waiting till his enemies be made his footstool. In Psalm 110, uh, he's quoting here, uh, you know, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. So he's just sitting there at the right hand forever and waiting now until the enemies become his footstool. Right now, the earth, the world, is under the power of Satan. Satan rules in this evil world. Paul said, at one time, you lived after the things of the world. One time, you were just meandering according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air that even now is working in the children of disobedience among whom we all once lived. Recognizing that the world is under Satan's influence, Satan's power. Very, very obvious today when you hear the popular music, when you hear what's going on in the world today, obvious that Satan is in control. But one day, Satan's rule is going to come to an end. But as men today are rebelling against God's authority more and more, the world is ripening now for the judgment of God. God is very patient, very long-suffering, 
But right now the world is ripening for the judgment of God. And once God judges the world in what we call the great tribulation, then God will subdue all of the rebellion and the enemies of Jesus, and Jesus will come to reign over the earth, and he will establish his kingdom of righteousness and joy and peace. And when the Lord who is our life shall appear to reign, then shall we also appear with him in glory to reign with him as kings and priests throughout the millennium of his kingdom reign. So right now he, is, he made the sacrifice and he's just there waiting until the Father has accomplished the purposes and subdues the enemy and the Lord will then come to reign, expecting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, that is of himself, he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Isn't that glorious? By his one offering, your sins have been taken care of forever. By his one offering. Wherefore, the Holy Spirit also is a witness to us. For after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them, quoting from Jeremiah 31 now, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. You know, that's the glorious thing about God's forgiveness. And when we talk about forgiveness, we really don't understand the term because we think of it in our terms. Yes, I'll forgive you, but I don't forget. <laughs> and when a person comes and says, oh, I'm so sorry, I don't know why I told those lies about you, I don't know what kind of, would you please forgive me? Yes, yes, you're forgiven. But then I hear that they're telling the same story still. And, and so I say, hey, wait, you know, how come I, someone called me the other day and said you were talking to him and told him this thing. How come? I thought you said you were sorry and you were lying and you asked me to forgive you, but how come you're doing it again? Oh, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. Well, wait a minute. You know, you see, I remember. We remember too, ourselves. And Satan so often is using our past sins as a hammer to beat us down, reminding us of the evil that was in our hearts, the evil that we did. And he puts us into remembrance to bring us into condemnation. But the glorious thing is that God said he won't remember them. My, their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. I mean, if that doesn't make you want to shout, I don't know what will. God doesn't remember my sins. Now, for that reason, I think it's not a good idea to remind him. <laughs> Except the fact that you've been cleansed, you've been forgiven, and he doesn't remember them. Now, where remission of these things is, there is no more offering for sin. There's no necessity to have the annual uh, Yom Kippur. There's no necessity of having the daily sacrifices anymore. There, the sacrifice is complete. And thus, there isn't the constant remembrance year after year of, oh, we've sinned, oh, we've sinned, oh, we've sinned, you know. Uh, that's, that's gone because... It's a complete sacrifice, and we just rest in that finished work of Jesus. Having therefore, brethren, boldness. So this is the, the, the result of it all now. It gives us boldness to enter into the holiest or into the holy of holies by the blood of Jesus. We can come into the presence of God 
through the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. But not only can we come in, but we can come in boldly. Now the Old Testament high priest went in fearful. He never knew if he would come out. If there was a flaw within the sacrifice, he'd be smitten dead in the presence of God. And so he went in with great fear. But we can come in boldly because of the sacrifice of Jesus, his blood, which was shed for our sins. And we come in by the new and the living way, not under the old covenant of the law, with all of its prescriptions, but we come in by this new and living way. Jesus died for our sins, but he rose again for our justification. And he ever lives to make intercession for us. So we come not with the dead sacrifices, but we come in the living Lord. And he is the door into the sheepfold, and we enter by him into the presence of God boldly, by the new and the living way, the living Lord, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. The, the Old Testament, the, the things were consecrated by the sacrifice, by the blood of the sacrifices. But Jesus has consecrated this way for us through his own body. The, the, the veil, so to speak, that separated man from God in Jesus was removed. And so uh, we have access, boldness of access through him. And also, the second thing we have, we have boldness to enter. Secondly, we have a high priest over the house of God. So you and I are the house of God. That is, God dwells in the midst of his people. God dwells in the church. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. He dwells among his people. And so the Bible speaks of uh, the church as, as being uh, the dwelling place, the household of God, the dwelling place of God, and uh, dwelling among us. Our high priest over the house of God. So as a result, let us first of all draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Draw near unto God, he'll draw near unto you but you can do so in full assurance. Faith in Jesus. He completed the work. Nothing can be added. And so I can be fully assured. No doubts, no qualms, no hesitation. I can come in to the presence of God in full assurance, drawing near to him in full assurance having our hearts sprinkled from the evil conscience. That is, through Jesus Christ, the evil conscience, the conscience of the evil that I have done, has gone. My conscience is clear. I can sleep at night. Jesus bore my sins for me. He has put them away. He doesn't remember them. And so our hearts sprinkled from the evil conscience and our bodies washed in the pure water. The priest would go through the bathing processes in this laver that was outside and, and he would wash himself, take a bath and put on the clean uh, robes and so forth to go in to the presence of God. But we're washed through Jesus Christ, been made clean. And uh, so we have the entrance. But secondly... 
let us hold fast our profession of faith without wavering because he is faithful who promised. The book of Hebrews was basically written to call many of the Jews back to a full trust in Jesus Christ. Tradition is something that is very difficult to break, especially religious traditions. There are many people today who are all bound up in religious tradition, but they are far from God. And the religious traditions mean more to them than the Word of God. And even within Christianity, there are those traditions that have developed when, within the various churches that people hold tenaciously to. They are not biblical. They are not scriptural. But they're traditions. But they are so ingrained in the people that they would take their tradition over the Word of God. And that's really a sad state to be in. And that was the condition of the Jews. They were bound by tradition to the law, to the ordinances, the sacrifices, and all of the law. And though they had embraced Jesus Christ as the Messiah, realized that he was indeed the Messiah, yet there was that hesitancy to leave the traditions completely. And they were sort of, well, maybe wanting to have a little insurance. Oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but I'll take this little lamb and I'll go offer the sin offering, you know. Uh, and uh, just sort of a, a, a kind of an insurance policy. But he's saying, no, it, it doesn't work that way. And Jesus is complete. His sacrifice is complete. Nothing can be added. You are complete in him. And so uh, let us hold fast this pro profession. Let's not go back to Judaism. Let's no, not go back to the law and try to be justified by the law any longer. Even in the early church, there, there developed a real problem because of the converts in Jerusalem. Many of them were priests, and they had come to a faith in Jesus Christ. But they were holding on to the traditions, and then they decided that they would put the Gentiles under the same traditions. So when they came to the church in Antioch and they saw the liberty of the Gentile believers, they said, wait a minute. You can't be Christians and do that. You've got to be circumcised. You've got to keep the law of Moses in order to be saved. And Paul heard what was going on and he got hold of these fellows. And he says, wait a minute. You guys are bringing division within the body here. You're denying the grace of God in Jesus Christ. Well, we have orders from Jerusalem. Paul said, let's go back to Jerusalem. We'll get this thing settled. And so Paul took them back to Jerusalem along with Barnabas, and the church called a council to determine this very issue of what place the Gentile believers had to the law. And it is interesting that Peter told how God called him to the Gentiles, to the house of Cornelius. And Peter said, I don't see any reason to put on the Gentile believers a yoke of bondage that neither we nor our fathers have been able to bear. All of the traditions and all, why should we try and put it on? We haven't been able to handle it. Why should we put it on them? And so it was finally decided that the Gentiles could be saved without keeping the law, uh, without uh, doing the sacrifices and so forth. But with the Jews, there was that danger uh, of realizing Jesus is the Messiah, but still held and bound by the traditions of the law and sort of migrating back towards that 
kind of a legal relationship with God rather than the loving relationship that God desired. Of course, that's where the whole thing broke down in the Old Testament. They developed a legal relationship with God. They were doing the legal thing, but they weren't doing the loving thing. And God didn't want a legal relationship. He wants a loving relationship with each of us. And that, of course, he provided in his love in giving his son for us to bring us into a loving relationship. So let's hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Don't be on the fence. Don't be wavering on this issue. For God is faithful who has promised. He's promised us redemption through Jesus. He's faithful. The sacrifice of Jesus is complete. And so God is faithful. Then thirdly, let us consider one another how to provoke one another to love and to good works. The purpose and part of the purpose for the church is for exhortation that we might be encouraged to good works, encouraged to seek the Lord, encouraged to forsake the things of the world, encouraged to walk close to Christ. And, and that's a part of the reason for our gathering is for the exhortation as well as edification, being built up in our faith and uh, to be comforted in the scriptures, to grow in our understanding and knowledge of the purpose and the will of God for our lives. So let's consider how that we can just encourage one another to love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Some had forsaken the assembling with the church. But exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. How much more? As we're living in the last days, and evil is abounding. Jesus said, evil days shall wax worse and worse. And truly they are. Look at where we are today morally compared to where we were 50 years ago, 25 years ago. I mean, we're going down the pit in an exponential rate of speed. Moral decay, decline. Now, some interesting verses. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. The sin that he is referring to here is the sin of apostasy, turning your back on Jesus, turning away from Jesus and seeking now salvation through the law or by some other process. If you sin willfully, that is, turning your back on Jesus who died for our sins, there, after you've received the knowledge of the truth in Jesus, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. That little goat, that little lamb, that ox that you take to the priest and you lay your hands on the head, confess your sins, it doesn't do it. There's no other sacrifice. There's only one sacrifice for our sins that God will accept, and that is the blood of his only begotten son that was shed for us. There's no more sacrifice. And so this is the sin of turning away from the truth of Jesus Christ, turning your back on him. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. If you would say something blasphemous against the law of Moses being in Israel, 
if two or three people would testify that they heard you blaspheming the law, they would take you out and stone you to death. You remember the story of um, Jezebel and her husband Ahab, and he wanted the field of Naboth, the vineyard of Naboth. And of course, Ahab had all kinds of property, lots of vineyards, but Naboth had a, just a lovely vineyard that he had really taken care of. And Ahab coveted that vineyard. So he came to Naboth and he said, I would like to buy your vineyard. And Naboth said, oh no, I could never sell it. It's, it's the family's vineyard. I inherited it from the family and I have to pass it on to the family. It, it's the family's and, and I, I would never even consider selling it. So old Ahab went around sulking. I mean, instead of enjoying everything he had, uh, covetousness, it just leads to sulking. He went around just sulking all the time. And his wife, Jezebel, said, what's the matter with you? I want Naboth's vineyard. <laughs> and he just would go around sulking. And she finally said, okay, I'll get it for you. And so she hired a couple of crooks to go to the judges and say, we heard Naboth blaspheming the law. These, these guys were liars, but they came to the judges, and so Naboth was brought to trial, and, and they testified, we heard him speak against the law of Moses. So Naboth was stoned to death, and Jezebel said, there's your vineyard, honey. Evil, evil thing. But that was he that despised Moses' law was put to death under two or three witnesses without mercy. They didn't show mercy on him. Of how much worse punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under foot the Son of God and has counted the blood of his covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace. If under Moses' law you die without mercy because of two or three witnesses against you, how much worse do you suppose the punishment will be for those who have trodden underfoot Jesus Christ, have counted the blood of his covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and they have done despite to the Spirit of grace, God's Spirit that has called them. The punishment that will be meted out by God is unthinkable for those who would despise the Son of God and God's provision for their salvation. Count the blood of his covenant an unholy thing. They've done despite to the spirit of grace. For we know him who has said, Vengeance belongeth to me. I will repay, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of of the living God. Fearful thing. You say, have people actually done that? Turned their backs on Jesus? Denied the faith that they once professed? Count now the sacrifice of Jesus as just nothing. Have done despite to the spirit of grace. I think one of the most shocking things that I've come across in recent times is this book that has been written by Charles Templeton 
who was once a close associate with Billy Graham, was once a tremendous evangelist, used of God in big campaigns in Canada, very active in the Youth for Christ movement. I've heard him speak at giant rallies. Brilliant man. Turn many people to Jesus Christ. But has recently written a book in which he denounces the belief in God, denounces the Bible, denounces as folly the faith he once had in Jesus Christ. He said he has developed intellectually beyond the ability to any longer accept the myths and the fallacies of the Bible. The scripture here is speaking about such people. And it is a warning. How much worse punishment do you suppose the person is thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God, counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing done despite to the Spirit of grace? It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. So the warning against turning away, turning your back on Jesus, on the faith that you once had in him. But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured great fight of afflictions. Remember when you first accepted Jesus Christ? The, the afflictions, the, the persecution that you went through the former days, partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by the reproaches and the afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used. Your new friends and the new fellowship that you had, the things that you endured, the, the sneering remarks and, and all. Remember those, Paul, or the writer says, and I think it was Paul, and I think we have here the proof in verse 34, or at least evidence, for you had compassion on me in my bonds. Paul spent a lot of time in prison, and this could very well be one of Paul's prison epistles. And his knowledge, his knowledge of the Old Testament law really came from a background of a rabbi. And uh, I, I agree with most commentators that Paul, no doubt, is the author of the book of Hebrews. For you had compassion of me and my bonds, and you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing that in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. You know, it's an interesting thing how that when we declare our faith in God and our love for God, that oftentimes God allows our love or our faith to be put to the test. Satan said concerning Job, he only loves you and serves you because you've given him so much, take it away and he'll curse you. And sometimes God allows our faith to be tested. And uh, I think of how Don McClure was talking one day on how God took him through difficult situations. And the idea was, will you still love me if? And Don went through these tests, and his most recent, of course, has been the loss of 
the sight in his right eye as the result of a stroke. The pressure, the blood pressure just sort of blew out the retina in the right eye and Don no longer can see out of his right eye. And it was, he said as this, if the Lord was saying, will you love me even if you don't have a right eye? Of course, Don was commiserating with Kay the other day and said, Kay, I, I'd do anything for you. I'd give my right eye for you, Kay. <laughs> she said, thanks a lot, Don. How about your left? But Don has said that the things that the Lord has taught him, the closeness of the relationship that is developed because of the loss of his right eye, he said, I would gladly give my right eye for it. In fact, I would rather have my eye as it is and now have the relationship and the depth of relationship that I've gained than to have my eye back if I had to lose this depth of relation that I've come to. Remember, the writer says, what it was. For you had compassion of me and my bonds because and you endured the hardship because you know that in heaven you've got an enduring reward. These things on the earth are going to pass anyhow. But you know in heaven you've got an enduring reward. So you took with joy the spoiling of your goods. So now the exhortation that ties in with this previous warning against turning away sinning willfully, turning your back on Jesus once you've received his knowledge. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has a great recompense of reward. Don't cast away your confidence in Jesus. It's great reward. For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might obtain the promise. Now, this is the promise of the coming again of Jesus Christ, and the exhortation is towards patience. Talking of the second coming of Jesus, James said that we should have patience as we wait for the coming of our Lord. For the Lord is waiting for the complete fruit of harvest. Now, I have to say that I am becoming very impatient for the coming of the Lord. As I look at the conditions of the world and how they are so rapidly deteriorating, I am becoming impatient. But the Lord of harvest has, is waiting for the complete fruit of harvest and has great patience towards it. Have patience, brethren. Establish your soul, James said. Peter said in the last days there would be scoffers. They would say, where is the promise of his coming? Since our fathers have fallen asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. But he said, God is not slack concerning his promises, but he's faithful to us. And he gives them the reason for the delay. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord knows those that are going to come to Jesus Christ tomorrow night in the Monday night study here. He knows those that will be coming to Jesus Christ on Saturday when the men gather there in Anaheim. And he's waiting for them. Hopefully, one of them will be the last of the Gentiles to be saved. <laughs> But the Lord is waiting for the complete fruit of harvest and has great patience towards it. So you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come 
will come and will not tarry. So you have need of patience. A little while, he's going to come. He won't tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, and this is what we were talking about earlier, what he's talking about, a person that draws back from his faith in Jesus Christ, a, a man who willfully sins, willfully turns his back, denies Jesus once having been in the family of God. If any man draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Quoting actually from uh, Habakkuk. But we are not of them, the writer assures, who draw back unto perdition, but we are of those that believe to the saving of the soul. Oh, yes. Hang in there. The Lord's going to come soon. Have patience. Hang in. And in the meantime, enjoy the access that you have to the Father. Have a loving relationship with God made possible through Jesus Christ because He loves us. And He has provided once and for all for our guilt and our sin. No condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Father, how grateful and thankful we are for this wonderful salvation that you have offered to us through your Son. The forgiveness of sin the washing and the cleansing, the blotting out of the past. Lord, thank you for opening the door to us and inviting us to come in to fellowship with you. And for the access that we have where we can come boldly into your presence, into this throne of grace to receive mercy. Lord, you are so good, and we thank you for it. Amen. Shall we stand? The pastors are down here in the front to minister to you tonight. If you have any needs, you desire prayer, they're here to pray with you, to pray for you. The word minister means servant. We're here to serve you tonight, whatever spiritual need you may have. So after the service, feel free to come on down and talk with them. They want to pray with you and minister to you in any way possible. And so feel free to come and share with them and pray with them. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the 